This opening slide shows the softer side of farming with cute sheep and cute young farmers taking at the 2018 Liscard Prime Stock Show. The show was held in the Dean Street cattle market for many years until closure in December 2017. The show moved to Belitho Farm, but now farmer James Moon has retired, its future is uncertain. Nothing has been planned so far for 2021. The Moon family first arrived at Belitho in 1875. Mandy? The images of the acrylic on canvas paintings you'll see today are from Jane Stanley's book, A Brush with the Past. Jane consulted experts at the Royal Cornwall Museum, the Cornwall Archaeological Society and Exeter University to produce as accurate as possible interpretations. Her 2009 publication has a foreword written by the late Tony Blackman, who at the time was chairman of the Cornwall Heritage Trust and honorary vice chair uh, president of the Council for British Archaeology, so a worthy endorsement. Some authorities believe that wool was originally combed directly off the sheep, as the image on the left shows. Combs and shears have been discovered at Iron Age sites in both Essex and Cambridge, as well as a huge hoard at Harlin Bay, east of Padstow. This hoard includes various sized slate needles and loom weights used in weaving. Mandy? Iron Age sites nearer to Liscard are at Cadsonbury on the way to Cannington and Castle Cannock near Bodmin. Hillfort School in Old Road is built on the site of an Iron Age settlement. Before building work commenced, the archeologists went to work, but only found a small flint scraper. But it is quite likely that uh, school lessons are taking place on the site of the start of the wool trade in Liscard. Mandy? <clears throat> Some developing countries are still using hand clippers when shearing away from an electricity source. There are examples of these held in, uh, in Liscard Museum. Mandy? In March 1877, Frederick York Woolsey revolutionised the wool industry across the world. He patented his Woolsey sheep shearing machine in Australia and every wool producing country was buying them. Once again, you can see one in Liscard Museum. Mandy? Returning to the Iron Age in the Harlin Bay Horde, many examples of spindle walls were found. And closer to Liscard, several were found at Castle Door on the way to Foy. Although more famous for Civil War battle, Castle Door is thought to have originally been an Iron Age fort. Mandy? English woolen cloth was a prized commodity in Roman times. The Romans are credited with introducing sheep with the long white wool that we generally see today. Previously, soy and Manx Loughton breeds were reared in Cornwall. Small in stature and dark in colour, their wool would have been very difficult to bleach and dye. The nearest Roman camp to Liscard was at Nanstallen, near Bodmin. Finds from the site include a brooch, several coins, lots of pottery, and while Jan St Jane Stanley was working on this painting, she discovered a child-sized gold ring with palm leaf emblems. All have been, all have been dated to the Anglo-Romano period. Mandy? These are sketches of the coins, beads, rings, buckle and brooch pin found at Nanstalen Roman Fort site. They can be viewed at Bodmin Museum. It's said that the humble fleece is the commodity on which England's fortunes were founded. During the 12th century, wool became England's greatest natural asset as a major source of revenue through the export of both woven cloth and raw wool. In 1181, Cornish woolen textiles were sent to Roger of Winchester, who was the king's almoner, to the value of 66 pounds, 13 shillings and four pence. Mandy? The mayor and burgesses of Liscard were great supporters of the wool trade. 
In the 1581-82 mayor's accounts, a payment of 10 shillings and sixpence was made for a beam and ropes for the yarn weights. In Elizabethan times, Cornish wool was described as a base and coarse kind of cloth, usually made for the poor people beyond the seas, most commonly shipped to Brittany. The Cornish wool was so coarse it was exempt from export tax, but abuses occurred. Other counties mixed their fine taxable wool with the coarse Cornish and claimed the ex exemption for the tax. On the 22nd of January 1586, the Borough of Liscard decreed that every woman and maid above seven years unmastered and having neither occupation or trade to exercise themselves to better advantage shall weekly spin the several tasked rates here on them imposed. They every Thursday morning bringing home their tasks shall receive more work of their master. Can I have to have a drink? If any do miss this weekly task or defraud in weight or, or work, be punished by stocks or whipping. Those lacking spinning wheels or cards to be brought by the collectors and deducted by one penny a week of their wages. The purpose was to put the, Id the idle to work, reform the riotous and not to become a burden on the parish and in later years to avoid going to the workhouse. Mandy? <coughs> Several items appear in the Mayor's 17th century accounts in connection with the wool industry. In 1604-05, five shillings and two pence was received when a stray sheep was sold. Its wool was sold separately for 18 pence. In 1624-25, various sums were paid to Mr O and Mr Rowe for pairs of wool cards. In 1652-53, to S. Elliot for mending the weighing house, 10 shillings and sixpence, and for weights for the yarn market, one, sh one pound, one shilling and sixpence. And brought before the magistrates in 1668, seven people for weighing parcels of saleable wool in their private houses and not using the town weights. Mandy? Smuggling was rife through the ports of Lou, Polpero and Foy, not only for goods coming in, but also for goods going out to avoid the export tax. On August the 17th, 1661, King Charles issued an order to seize a vessel named John, moored in Foy and headed for St. Marlo. The cargo was tin and combed wool, having no tax paid on them. In order to give the legitimate sale of English wool a boost, King Charles passed the Burial in Wool Acts of 1667 and 1678. It was decreed that no corpse shall be buried in anything other than what is made of sheep's wool only, nor put in any coffin lined or faced with any material but sheep's wool, on pain of forfeiture of five pounds. The exemption being if death was from the plague. <laughs> An affidavit had to be signed. <laughs> Some noise coming from somebody. <laughs> Can whoever's making the noise uh, go on to mute, please? The exemption being if death was from the plague. An affidavit had to be signed for every funeral to confirm that the act had been complied with. The Plint Parish Register record records that on the death of Bishop Jonathan Trelawney on July the 19th, 1721, his family opted to pay the five pound penalty. Mandy? During the 1680s, Mrs. Philippa Randall kept a very respectable draper and milliner establishment in Badinic. Her customers were the best dressed ladies in prosperous foy across the river. The price of one of her fine woolen shawls was the equivalent of a month's income 
for a Liscard spinner. The early 1700s saw a rapid increase in imports of yarn from Ireland, causing much distress to Cornish spinners in many towns, including Liscard. Along with others, Liscard petitioned the House of Commons in February 1708 as follows. Spinning is two thirds of the labor market, employing many hundreds of families. But in recent years, vast quantities of worsted and woolen yarn spun in Ireland has been brought to our market. Many poor people were thereby impoverished and likely to become a burden on the parish. Irish products were being sold 30% cheaper than the Cornish. Mandy? When Daniel Defoe toured Cornwall in 1726, he wrote of Liscard, remarkable for a very great trade in all manufactories, with spinners encouraged by the woolen manufacturers of Devonshire, with long trains of pack horses carrying the wool and yarn. Mandy? Liscard's cottage industry was now in decline, under particular threat from Hargreave spinning Jenny from 1764. By 1772, 50% of British textile exports were produced in Yorkshire's mills as a result of gradual industrialization. Through the 1700s, the borough of Liscard continued to support and invest in the local wool trade. In 1741, three pounds three shillings was spent on a feast for the yarn buyers and that sum continued for a further nine years. In 1745, two pounds nine shillings and sixpence was paid to the farmers of the market. 49 and a half packs of wool plus ten shillings and sixpence to those who encouraged the market. Mandy? In 1778, Mr. E. Hobling was paid four pounds, nine shillings and eightpence for wall cards, a frequent item. Along with spinning, card making was also in decline at this time. An observation by one 18th century writer was that some of the principal tradesmen in this guard are card makers and employed many women and children in preaching, doubling, pricking, and crooking the length of leather. The men completed the card by nailing it onto a wooden back with a handle. These cards were used in preparing the wool for hand spinning. The women earned six pence per day and the children half that amount. By 1800, machinery had put an end to another home manufactory. Mandy? <laughs> This is John Allen's summing up of the wool trade in Liscard in the 17th and 18th centuries. The yarn market in Liscard and in some other towns of Cornwall was for a long time considerable, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries. The public sale and weighing of yarn and worsted took place every market day. The standings for this purpose, extending for a great length from the market house through Fourth Street, and often occasioning disputes by their crowded attendants with the shopkeepers and shoemakers and other dealers. The buyers were the Devonshire serge makers or manufacturers, and the sellers were the yarn jobbers or merchants of the district. These employed the poor of the town and country to card and spin by hand, attending alternately at spinning houses in the adjacent parishes once a month or oftener to deliver out wool and receive the yarn which had been spun. Steady employment in their own houses at moderate wages was thus furnished to the women and children, and many of the men did not disdain from assist in wet weather and in the evenings. For them all and for the community, this was a great benefit while it lasted, and the loss in this respect, produced by the introduction of the spinning jenny and other machinery, from 1700 to 1800, was severely felt in this guard. Mandy? The 1852 Slater's Trade Directory shows that the leather industry was buoyant in this guard, with 13 boot and shoemakers, 
four leather finishers or sellers, two glove makers and a tannery on Tanyard Hill, which is now Conbridge Hill. There were plenty of wooden, woollen goods sellers, 10 linen and woollen drapers, two haberdashers, nine milliners and nine trailers. Sorry, trailers, nine tailors. But in connection with the production of wool and woolen products, the nearest we find is Blamey & Co. And they were listed as wool staplers and fellmongers, dealers in wool and skins. Mandy? So we'll move more swiftly on to the 20th century. Our Richard K. Broad returned to Liscard after serving in the army during World War I. His drapery business at number 11 4 Street had been left in the hands of his wife Alice, live-in employee Marianne Godfrey and their daughter Minnie. R.K. started a new line of business. He purchased large quantities of five-ply knitting yarn from Tippett and Sons in Plymouth, which he sold and delivered to home knitters, particularly to the fishermen's wives in Polpero, who used it to knit the traditional Polpero knit frock, organzi. In 1851, Polpero's census listed 28 women and girls giving their occupation a knitter. There were probably many more besides. Their trade having been learnt from an early age in the Port's Dame schools. Mandy? The caption for the photo on the left is Polpero women at Peak's house on the cliff path during World War II, a knitting and meeting place for more than a hundred years. Our case first trips from Liscard to Polpero were made on a motorbike and sidecar, but he had an accident on Polpero Hill one day and lost the tips of two of his fingers. So from then on he bought a car and employed a driver by the name of William Brewer. Another contract of our case was to supply to the Union Workhouse in Station Road with grey pinstripe frocks and white pinnies for the ladies and brown corduroy suits for the men. Mandy? Can you hear me? I doubt many of the Polpero ladies would have purchased one of these from the Automatic Knitting Machine Company Limited. They had factories in London, Edinburgh, Newcastle and Dublin in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Their machines are made of cast iron and brass and they receive many awards for their progressive designs. This one with all the accessories and instructions and in the original wooden box can be seen in this card museum. Mandy? In 1918, at the end of World War I, it was celebrated with a massive firework display in Castle Park, organised by the Explosives Works at Trago Mills. A captain in the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, Cubit Blamey, returned from India to work in his father's wool mill at Lamellium, the last reminder of his wool trade. John H. Blamey had established the mill in 1883 to complement the successful agricultural merchants Blamey and Morecambe. Cubitt took over management at Lamellium in 1923 on his father's death. The two photos show him positioned in similar uh, positions in the centre of his troops on the left and later with his workforce on the right. Mandy? A 1936 advertisement heralded the arrival of the sheep dipping season in Liscard Farms Use Cooper's sheep dip, the most reliable on the market. This period between the wars was a busy time for Blamey and Morecambe, with depots and stores at Liscard, Lou, Lering, Double Boys, and St Germans, all alongside the transport facilities of either the railway or the rivers. Mandy? I think um, we might need to go on to the next one. Mandy, that's it. Um, the Devon and Cornwall walls were contractors. Let's see. Um, 
Now, I've missed a little bit. Okay, so there was an advert previously um, which highlighted uh, the three aspects of Blamey and Walkham Limited business. Longevity, established in 1820, now approaching 140 years experience. Innovation, using radio and telephones and teleprinters, uh, making ordering simple. Diversity, you must see the new Ford cars in their Barn Street showrooms. Soon after this, the wool processing operation was sold to Devon and Cornwall Wools. Devon and Cornwall Wools were contractors for the British Wool Marketing Board in Bradford. Local man Paul Day was employed at Lamellion from 1966 to 1990 and gives an account, an account of, his operation, of the operations there. The fleeces were brought in from farms on trailers, in cattle trucks and even horse boxes from all over, the Cor over Cornwall. Washing and scouring took place in the three-storey building until 1969 when it was demolished. The fleeces started out on the top floor where they were unbinded, opened out and thrown down a hatch to the floor below. A machine with long spikes tore into the fleeces until it was in small pieces, then sent, that, sent down a chute into one of the wash bowls. The wash bowls were 40 feet long and eight foot wide. The wall was pushed slowly through a mixture of hot water and industrial soap with forks, eventually passing through the rollers to squeeze the water out and then into a huge dryer until it was clean and white as snow. Mandy? A skilled uh, team of uh, graded and weighed the wool. Wool of the same grade was baled with a sample being sent to Bradford for buyers to examine before the monthly auctions. After the auction, the lorries at Lamellion were loaded with bales and de delivered to the buyer, usually the wool mills in uh, Yorkshire. Each bale weighed 500 weight, four bales making a tonne. This lorry is carrying 18 tonnes of wool. And uh, thanks to Paul Day for the photograph there. Um, Mandy? The cleaning operations ended after numerous complaints of pollution in the East Loo River, leading to poor quality bathing water down at Loo Beach. During the 1969 demolition of the three-storey building, the workers firstly removed the roof, then the interior floors, and then the end walls, intending to take down the long side walls the next morning. With no means of support and a stiff breeze, <laughs> the uh, side walls were demolished, crushing the staff canteen where the mill workers, including Paul Day, were having their break only a few hours before. Fortunately, there were no casualties and the dem demolition workers were called back to clear the rubble from the Loo Valley line so that the trains could start running again. The photo from 2016 marks the occasion when over a hundred people accepted the challenge to boost train passenger numbers at Coombe Junction, so elevating its lowly position of second least use station in the UK, saving it from possible closure. Mandy? Uh, this is an article from the Cornish Times of 1976 um, and it's entitled Wool, wool Sack Stuffing Made at Liscard. The new stuffing for the wool sack on which the Lord Chancellor sits in the House of Lords has been blended and processed at the Wool Marketing Board's factory at Lamellion, Liscard. A square bag of top quality wool covered with a red cloth the sack was first used in the reign of Edward III. Last summer, it was thought necessary that it should be refilled and renovated. The British War Marketing Board was asked to obtain the necessary material from the Commonwealth wool producing countries and also Great Britain. Various five pound consignments eventually arrived at the board's factory at Liscard from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, India, Pakistan, Cyprus, Kenya, Bekuwalo land, uh, Basuto land and Swaziland. There were also supplies from the Falkland Islands, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
and it was the task of blending into three grades the finest wool to form the outside layer of the coarse, coarsest at the centre. The blending was expressly undertaken by Mr John Roberts, who retires at the age of 65 next year. Mandy? It was in 1972 that uh, Lamellian Mill was taken over by the British Wool Marketing Board. On July the 8th, 2015, by a piece in the Cornish Times, the board advised wool producers how to maximise the value of their wool by presenting their fleeces correctly. And then it goes on to give a, a long um, detailed explanation of how they should go about uh, producing their fleece, fleeces to the buyers to get the best price. Uh, Mandy? In April 2016, the board relaunched its Golden Fleece competition in a search for the best fleece in the UK. Champion fleeces from the network of board, of board depots, including Liscard, across the UK and from 12 regional agricultural shows, including the Royal Cornwall show. The two categories in the competition were traditional carpet and speciality knitwear, but I'm not aware of the results. Mandy. And here's a piece again from the Cornish Times in 2018, um, which uh, explains the current operation at Lamellian. Today, British wool is the last remaining agricultural commodity board in the UK, representing more than 40,000 producers and 30 millions of 30 million kilos of wool each year. The organisation has a network of 11 grading depots to process fleeces, and one of them is in Liscard, handling wool from producers from across Cornwall and South Devon. Lots of our producers deliver their wool themselves. Once wool arrives at the Liscard depot, it's weighed, then every single individual fleece is graded. Once graded, wool is packed into 8,000 kilo lots of a particular quality. And, and these lots are sold in an electronic auction. 18 of these are held each year, administered from British Wool's headquarters. Some 50% of British Wool is used in the carpet and rug manufacturing industry. There is also a growing and enthusiastic UK market for craft producers of clothing. Mandy? Evidence of the growing and enthusiastic UK market for craft producers of clothing and other products is the popular three bags full market held in Liscard's public hall every October mm -hmm. since 2013. In 2019, hundreds of people headed to Liscard for the annual crafters market. Three quarters of the 500 visitors came from outside the town. There were 36 exhibitors' stalls, children's activities, music and food from the Real Junk Food Project. Over £700 was raised for Mind, the mental health charity. A huge success and not to be outdone by COVID-19, the market will be held online and go to www.3bagsfull.org to enjoy that. Mandy? In the months leading up to the Three Bags Full Market, the town centre is decorated by a, te a team of yarn bombers. It seems that anything that doesn't move is adorned by their colourful woollen handiwork. Railings, lampposts, benches, everything gets their colourful treatment. Visitors comment on how wonderful Liscard Town Centre looks at this time of, of the year through the hard work of the yarn bombers and of course the award-winning Liscard in Blooms floral displays. Mandy? Keeping alive the tradition of home spinning is the Liscard Spinners Guild, a very active group who meet in St Martin's Church Hall and attend events uh, across the county, giving demonstrations. 
At one meeting last year, a skills session was, uh, was on hand carding and uh, another tradition still not to be lost by these intrepid ladies. The Guild always attends the Liscard show, but sadly not this year for obvious reasons. Mandy? Finally, and to bring us completely up to date, British War recently made the following announcement. The good weather in April and May saw an early start to the 2020 sheep shearing uh, season. British Wool's Liscard Grading Depot has been receiving wool from producers and maintaining a high level of service. As British Wool enters its 70th year of operation, the UK faces the most severe recession in its history due to COVID-19. The announcement went on to detail the various ways that they will offer a consistent and steady supply of British wool onto the market. And they end by promising that wool producers can be assured that British wool will be at the forefront of, of leading the growth and renewal of wool values. But this will take time. We will emerge stronger from this period. Thank you very much for listening tonight. Okay, thank you, Brian. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I certainly learned an awful lot from it. Um, so yeah, that was brilliant. So I can see in the chat, we've already got a couple of questions from Gregor Morecambe. So I'm going to ask Gregor in a moment to unmute himself and um, to ask those questions. And whilst that's going on, if anybody else has got any questions, please do put them in, in the chat because I, I know Brian is, uh, is keen to take them. Desperate. So, <laughs> so um, Gregor, can you unmute yourself and, and ask your questions, please? Right, I think I've successfully unmuted. That's I'm going to go good. back and see what see what I actually put put in the questions now. Um, I think um, um, I think Brian answered one of the questions. I wondered if the blamey of blamey and company was jo was John Hitchens blamey, and I think yeah, he, that, that was the name that came up. Yeah, that was Cubit's father. Cubit's father. Well, well, my great. Uh, great grandfather George Gregor Morecambe was um, John Hitchens Blamey, John Hitchens Blamey's business partner long before they incorporated as Blamey and Morecambe. Ah, I see. And uh, yes, I that's believe, right. I believe they they both came up. Well, my great great grandfather George Gregor Morecambe's father was originally a copper miner from Gwennett, and I was poking around in some of the old. Um, um, census information down in Truro one time, and it appears the Blameys were also down that way. I think maybe the families knew each other from those days. Yeah, yeah, long-term connection certainly, but but the, the the mill, the wool industry, came a long time after they were first established as agricultural merchants. That's for sure. Right. Uh, yeah, I think the, I think the Melian Mill was built somewhere around 1870. Yeah, and they've been established a long time before that, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, indeed. Interesting, um, they went on to sell Ford motor cars. <laughs> well, they were only sub dealers. They used to get the main stock, I think, from there was a main dealer up in, I think, in Lanson. Ah, okay. Uh, but along the way, um, Sadin David ended up going through International Harvester and um, uh, Fordson tractors. They ended up with David Brown. And along the way, Dad had got a couple of Aston Martins brought down to the showroom as well. Yes, I had heard that, yeah. And uh, one of them was in the showroom, the other one was taking people out for rides, but I don't think the farming community was quite into Aston Martins. <laughs> no. Gregor, thanks very much for all that history, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. There was another little bit there that um, a guy called Malcolm Barber, he died oh, probably 10, 12 years ago now. But um, when I first knew him, um, he was working down in the, like the blacksmith forge attached to the wool factory. And he seemed to think that the last lot of wool that came in from Australia on sailing ship was processed at, at the Merlin factory. 
And I'm wondering, really? if, I wonder if this was the case, how would it have got there? Was it transshipped at Falmouth or did it, would it have come into Loo and come up on the canal? Because I believe the canal was still operational into what, nearly 1900 time. And it came the, um, right alongside the factory, I believe. The, the, the canal was defunct in 1860 when the Loo Valley line opened. Well, but I, they understood still... it, I understand it was still running for some years after that even, because I believe, um, um, I remember my grandmother telling me that um, she used, to, I think she used to have trips down to uh, the guys take sandwiches down to a couple of the guys on the boats, because I think um, uh, Blamey and Morecambe or Blamey and Morecambe were still running a couple of barges. Really? Even after the railway opened. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The, um, <laughs> just, to bring it, just to bring it up to date, um, standing on the parade in Liscard, you can still see the, uh, the farmers going by with all their fleeces in the trailers. Right. On a regular basis. A, a lot of the wool came down from Exmoor and um, from a market at Wedden Cross. Mm. Is there any other questions? We don't want to hog it too much, Gregor. Okay, that's fine. Okay, well, look, I've, I've got a question, Brian, which is that, um, it, I mean, it's clear from your talk that wool played an important role in all sorts of eras of Liscard's history, but what would you say would be the, the heyday of, of wool in Liscard? Well, I think it had to be in John Allen's time in the 18... Um, well, let's see, he was talking about the 17th and 18th century, wasn't he? So it, it's got to be just before the spinning jenny, before the Industrial Revolu uh, Re Revolution came along. And uh, the, in, world, in, in, world, in, in between the wars, Richard K. Broad had, had a, a magnificent um, uh, business going on with all the, all the Ganses being knitted down in Polpero. But the heyday... I, I would judge the hey, heyday in how many um, how many people were employed in it, and that's when the home spinners were at their height, and the women and children were earning a little bit of money, you know, while the while the father was probably down the mines or doing a bit of pilchard fishing or whatever. Um, so it's it's got a bit, I would think, in the 1700s. That for me would be. The, the judge, the measure should be when the most people were employed in it, not the right. profit that came from it. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. Um, now, if anybody else would like to ask a question but doesn't want to have to go through putting it in chat, if you just turn on your video and wave at me, um, then I will take your question. Um, so, Sally Brocklehurst, I've just seen you've turned on your video. Um, did you want to ask a question? But I'm just wondering, I don't live in Liscard, I'm between Tarot and Falmouth. Why Liscard? Were there other places in Cornwall that were processed for? Uh, Liscard has been the centre, the, um, it has been described in the past as being the biggest market town in the whole of Cornwall. Uh, um, and it's certainly now, you know, the, the, the centre of um, the centre of South East Cornwall. But in the periods that we're looking at, you know, in the heyday, in the 1700s and the 1800s, particularly if you look at the when the censuses came out, you will find that um, almost everybody that was in any sort of business had a had a servant, had a domestic servant. You know, the ironmonger had a domestic servant. Um, the tailor had a domestic servant. Liscard, for, for many, many years, was the centre of business and employment, not just in South East Cornwall, but from, from Cornwall itself. When you look at, at the, the, the places that some of the servants working in, you know, sort of, you know, just terraced houses, they come from Gwennett, they come from, you know, North Cornwall. They come from all over the county because Liscard was where, was where it was all happening. 
particularly um, in the back end of the 19th century, when the, uh, when the mining operations down, further down west were coming to an end, and copper was discovered on Carradon Hill, they flopped up the Liscard, and uh, that was, you know, the big period for employment. But but going right back to to the Doomsday Book, you know, I think the value was um, it was second. I'm trying to think which which uh, borough was the um, produced the most income for the duchy. I think it might have been Bodmin, but we were the second biggest producer of income uh, for the duchy going, you know, well, not the duchy in 1086 for the, for the Earls of Cornwall, as it was at the time. It was the second biggest, um, you know, producer of income. Um, yeah, I didn't know so, that. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Brian, and thanks for the question, Sally. Um, Vicky, you've turned on your video. Would you like to ask the question? Hi. Yeah, thanks, Brian. It's been really fascinating. Um, I was wondering why you think, um, given that this um, wool production was such a huge part of our employment in the past, why it's, it seems to have been really forgotten about? The wool industry, you think, has been forgotten about? Uh, it doesn't seem to be part of our sort of narrative in Cornwall with the whole... It's like the tin mining and China clay and things. It just doesn't seem to be talked about at that same kind of level. No, no. Um, I think probably it's not talked about so much these days because, well, it, it all happens up in the in the Yorkshire cotton mills. Um, we didn't we didn't industrialise down here. Um, we were very. Um, we were very good at home spinning um, <laughs> um, and carding, but the industrialization, I think, um, from what I can rem remember from economic history at school, it was mainly in the Midlands and, uh, and Lancashire and Yorkshire that the spinning jenny and all these other machines came, uh, came into being. Um, and up until Right up until when I was a, a lad, my my dad's eldest auntie used to come down and stay with us, and she was a forelady in the mills up in Lancashire, and they were still running. Um, but um, but yeah, we always we always talk about um, pilchards, tin, <laughs> and 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 not not so much on the farming side. So. But I think that's where it all went adrift from away from Cornwall is when the when the, you know the spinning and weaving became industrialised. Okay, thank you, Eileen. You had a question. Um, it, not a question, but just um, in relation to what Vicky has just asked. Um, I think unless people are particularly interested in wool, a lot of the wool industry has been forgotten. The history throughout the United Kingdom. Um, I was quite disappointed recently when I visited uh, a museum. Well, no, I visited Yorkshire. Uh, I visited York in Yorkshire and um, I went to the reference library because I wanted to read about the history because I knew a bit about um, a bit about the wool industry already in Yorkshire and the Dales and the Dales knitters and things. And the librarian knew nothing about the wool industry um she said there was a part of the library which was um social history mm. and i said well a social history over there oh no that's social history and i said well well and i just found one tiny book about the wool industry in that library wow um so i think a lot of people now have forgot you know just don't seem to be aware of it mm. Because there was there was one piece in the presentation that said that fifty percent of um, of exports had come from the Cornish, uh, sorry, from the Yorkshire mills, mm -hmm. which so uh, that sounds amazing that they seem to have forgotten all about it. Well, in York they had. I have visited a mill in in Bradford where they were a lot more knowledgeable and interested mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks very much for that, Eileen. Anybody else would like to ask a question? Please wave at me. Um, I can, uh, should, 
I, you're on two screens from my point of view, so I'm just clicking between the two screens to make sure I can actually uh, see everybody. Um, but yeah, if there's any more questions, give me a wave now. Once, once you switch your video on, obviously. Yes, what, one more, please. Yes, go ahead. If I can come back in. Um, I wonder whether, in fact, lack of water power put paid to Cornwall as a wool processor and Yorkshire had much more water power for the mills. Mm. Poss possibility. It does seem very wet down here on occasions, though. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Okay, but an interesting thought. Okay, well, um, go on, Vicky, you've got another one. You're on mute. Sorry, um, a question for you, Rachel. Are you going to cheer us all up by yarn bonging Liscard again this year? I, I, I don't know why you would think that I had anything to do with that. <laughs> um, but, um, They're anonymous. <laughs> You must have seen the picture in the Cornish Times a few years ago with everybody, um, you know, with all the faces um, hidden. Um, but um, I, I, I gather on the grapevine that um, shops and cafes um, in Liscard are going to be yarn bombed and there are, there are going to, there's going to be all sorts of rainbow bunting and all sorts of, you know, nice things um, to, to cheer things up in, in the current circumstances, but not outside this year. Um, but as Brian says, and thanks very much for the plug, Brian, for Three Bag School and for the spinners, um, the, um, the Three Bag School will be going ahead as a virtual event, so we'll have um, traders and also hopefully a couple of workshops and, and videos and so on. So we'll, we'll be doing what we can to celebrate wool in, um, in Liscard this autumn, and hopefully um, in 2021 uh, we'll be back, uh, normal service will be resumed. I think, I think it's interesting, though, um, that um, anybody who's not interested in crafting or wool would just say, well, there's no, no wool trade in this guard. I think if you stop most people in the street, they say that there's no wool trade in this guard. But the spinners, the bombers, you know, the crafters, unless you're actually interested in it, then, you know, and, and it's like me with the history of this guard. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no history in this guard. It's hopeless. But um, but unless you're interested, you won't find it. Yeah, yeah. And when you go looking, there's more than you might expect. Okay. Well, it would be really nice if everybody could just turn their videos back on again for a moment, um, just so that we can all see each other. It's been wonderful to have such a great audience um, this evening. Uh, when we first started planning this. Um, you know, we weren't quite sure how an online talk was going to work and with the obligatory uh, technical glitches at the beginning, um, to me, I think this has been wonderful to have so many people all here together and able to enjoy Brian's excellent talk. So um, thanks again very much to Brian for all his research and for presenting it in such a clear and entertaining way. Um, and thank you, thanks very much to all of you for taking part um, and hope to see some of you tomorrow and um, on Sunday at Rachel Bennett's talk, um, getting involved in, in Liscard Unlocked this year. So thank you, thank you all very much and good night.
Okay.